Hello again, Saints. I want to thank everyone for tuning in to another Thursday Night Bible Study and uh, going over the doctrine of who God has called us to be in Christ. And also, uh, we're looking at the Ephesians survey, um, and that's what we're taking a look at today. We're looking at the Ephesians survey and the Corinthian reproof. The Ephesians survey and the Corinthian reproof, and this is lesson number five. Lesson number five, and we're looking at God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ is what we are taking a look at. I'm um, just making sure I'm recording here. Okay. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> and also what we're doing is we're, and, and what, what that entails is looking at um, God the Father of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ is what we're going to be looking at in this study here. And we're looking at Jesus Christ in his aspect of being a son and what that meant to the father, not just not just a, any old son, so to speak, but the son that God says, this is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. It wasn't just that he, he be just just a a um, child or, or, or an, an heir, you know, um, you know, and, and, and the same thing is true with our children. You know, we desire more from our children than them just being more part of the family. You know, we desire that they that, that they don't they don't just uh, live at home all their life, that they don't just 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 sit around and 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 collect a um, uh, welfare check or something like that and stay at home with us. That that's not what we would have. What we would have for them to be, we would have for them to be more than just our heir, than just a a, a our child. We would want more from them. And a father desires a, a similar with us. He, he, he that we be no more children, that we that we grow up, that we only just as some people would say, oh, you know, you're already a son. They look at the context of what they look at what's over in, in Romans chapter eight. Romans chapter eight, verse fourteen, actually verse twelve down through verse uh, seventeen, or actually through nineteen, when it speaks about being a son and it be that joint heir with him, if we, if so be we suffer with him it, it, it you know people assume that that you have that, that what's being spoken about is what happens the moment you become justified unto eternal life and the if so be we suffer together uh, uh, suffer with him is talking about every single saint that every single saint is is being spoken about that that they too uh, that this speaks of them, but it speaks to each and every saint that we that God would have desire that we all cry out a father, that we all live unto him, bring forth honor and glory. God didn't just save us just so we can only just bring forth honor and glory at the cross when we die or that we only fulfill our position in heavenly places. Your father, and, and when I say this, it... <laughs> Well, I'll just say it. Your father deserves more glory on this earth from saints, other than the idea that they're only just saved, and they're and they're and they're and they're delivered out of the kingdom of of Satan and delivered onto a, 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 a being given unto him. But let's just move on with the verses. Let's take a look at Ephesians chapter one. Ephesians chapter one. Let's take a look at uh, what a faithful son means to the father. That, that's what I'm after here. What a faithful son means unto the father. And what I was saying there about the heir, some people assume being a son in the context of, of, of uh, eight, Romans chapter 8, verse 12, one down, is speaking about just a person who's just justified unto eternal life, who's only just a saint. That's not what it's speaking about. That's speaking to people that's going to bring forth honor and glory unto him and allow his word to work affection within them. Being what you are going to see today, what we're going to talk about, about sons, faithful sons, and what it means to him. Ephesians 1 verse 1, Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ, by the will of God, to the saints which are at Ephesus, and to the faithful in Christ Jesus. Now, some people might take a take offense to to uh, me putting these in two separate categories, that there are saints, but then there are faithful brethren. Well, you, you don't think so? All you have to do is think about 
the person who you who you've looked up to as far as in, in teaching teaching you write the vision or or or, or um, that you've you've grown by who and think about them and and think about others who are only just justified unto eternal life. Think about someone who you've just given the gospel to. And, 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 and think about the two different um, states of the brethren. And, and it, it, of course, it, like I said before, this, this ought not be hard to get, but sometimes people can, can make things harder based upon man trying to exalt his wisdom over the wisdom of God. Look at verse 2. Grace be to you and peace. And when you see this here, this is not just a, uh, hey, you know, God, 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 and, and Jesus like to send their uh, send their greetings onto y'all. That's not what this is saying either. But there would be grace and peace unto us from God our Father and from the Lord Jesus Christ, that we operate upon His godly grace and godly peace, just as we are to hold. We're going to be told to operate upon all spiritual blessings which are in heavenly places. We, you can operate upon some as we live on to in our lives and when we get in heavenly places. But grace be unto you, grace be to you and peace from God our Father and from the Lord Jesus Christ. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ who hath blessed us with all spiritual blessings in heavenly places. You know, and, and we'll get to verse 3. Um, well, we'll get to the spiritual blessings in heavenly places when we get to verse 2, which is God our Father. That's going to be next week. Next week, we're going to look at God our Father, and we're going to be looking at all the spiritual blessings and heavenly places that that's, that's designed that we be partakers of because we are faithful sons. And we don't think that all the only spiritual blessing that we have is of what he did on the cross, of what he did to justify us unto eternal life and what we have in heavenly places but that we come to understand about other spiritual blessings like the gift of sufferings as, as per Philippians 129. But um, let's see, let's see, let's see. And then most people would say, well, hey, why are you looking at God, our God, the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ first? Well, because when you look at the whole issue here, uh, remember, we were without hope, without God in the world. And what was first was Jesus Christ was that son in whom God the Father said, in whom I am well pleased. He's well pleased because he's bringing forth the Father's will. And that's what happens when we too, when we have children of our own, and we desire that our children bring forth our, our will, that they be a mini version of us, that they take on our identity. That's the point that they take on our identity, that they walk in, in uh, according to what we've taught them, whether it's the good of this world or whether it's the bad of this world, that we gave them the dangers, the, 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 the do's and don'ts. You know, we've, we've forewarned them about whether it's making bad decisions and whether it, 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 it's financial, whether so they won't run themselves in financial ruin, that that they'll that they'll walk the way we say that that they raise that that they too raised their children in their identity if they walked um, properly and, and and lived lived the uh, the way we've taught them to live and then they too bring forth an identity and then they would teach their children and bring forth an identity well God's designed that we do that similarly when we go and 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 bring forth the identity of our father and that's what we're going to see later on then we're going to get to the adoption of children because that's where this is all leading up to in the next verse about the adopt predestinated us unto the adoption of children and that adoption of children there's a lot that goes in that but you can't understand that if you only just think you're just god just desires that you only just be a saint that you only just be just just justified unto eternal life. But then you go, okay, you go through the systematic things. You you go to church, you you sing some, you sing the songs and, and and you stop doing this and stop doing that. But 
it, it, but you, you bring forth no fruit unto holiness. You, you, you can't, you don't bring forth the glory and honor that, that, that there is when you, when you uh, uh, preach and teach the gospel. And I'm not just talking about preach and teach and uh, get people justified unto eternal life, but that you build them up, that you too are strengthened, that you too be no more children. But let's move on. Come over to Exodus, Exodus chapter 4. Exodus chapter 4, let's look at verse 21. Exodus 4, let's look at verse 21. And, you know, when we're looking at this, we're looking at um, some of the things, and we're going to look at this next week, too, about when you get to the book of John, when it make, makes mention about um, he came into the world and, and his, his own received him not, but as many as received him to them gave he power to become the sons of God, even to them that believe on his name. We're going to see that there are many sons mentioned in God's word of truth. We just got to look at the context to see. You see the, the angels. We looked over in Job past two weeks. When it talks about the sons of God came to present themselves before the Lord, well, that's two, that's sons as angels, that the, the sons as a servant. That that's their capacity of being a son. They're not in His image after His likeness. That, but they're sons as servants. But we are talked about, and that's similar to over in the Book of Galatians. In the Book of Galatians, you, you see over there, you see. That, that a child is talked about as being only just as a servant. He's still a child, but he's not yet a son. And that's what, he, that's what the point in looking at this is about being a son. And you hate to use the word sonship for those who are um, for the um, weak in the faith, the brethren that are weak, weaker brethren, they they assume when you say stuff like that that you you know you're 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 uh, teaching a whole different different aspect of doctrine so to speak. This is what our father teaches. Every single every single epistle that Paul writes addresses the Lord God in heaven as being the Father of us who are being taught this doctrine by Paul. He is our father. We are son. We ought to be sons that are faithful sons. That's what he desires. Sometimes people just think that only thing Paul is addressing is us as saints and God as uh, the most high God. And the word father is not even being used. In, in any of his epistles is what some people think. They don't even understand the father to son relationship that we ought to have. Look at it, Exodus chapter four. What they want is just a, a genie type of thing that God's going to give bless them in all spiritual blessings in heavenly places. They assume that he's going to make things carnal come to pass for them. Look at chapter four, verse 21, Exodus. And the Lord said unto Moses, when thou goest to return into Egypt, see that thou do all those wonders before Pharaoh, which I have put in thine hand. But I will harden his heart that he shall not let the people go. What the Lord was saying here to Moses, he wanted Moses to operate upon the power of God. And bring show forth that hey look this ain't this is not just a mere man doing this. There's power behind this, and this power you're going to see your power is not even going to be able to fend against the servant of the Most High God. But when the heart when his heart is hardened, God's not hardening his heart on purpose, so to speak, to say I'm going to make his heart get hardened. He knows that once this doctrine is preached, what's, once this is preached to Pharaoh, and it is preached unto Pharaoh, Pharaoh's heart is going to be hardened. That's what's being shown here. And it's not that God's saying, well, I know he's going to harden his heart. No, he knows what he's going to say 
which is truth, Pharaoh's not going to get it. And his heart is going to be hardened. Look at uh, verse 22. And thou shalt say unto Pharaoh, thus saith the Lord, capital L, capital O, capital R, capital D, Jehovah. Israel is my son, even my firstborn. Notice what he calls Israel. He wants them to be his son. He said they are his sons. That they're going to be ones who's going to show forth, show forth uh, the power of God. That they're going to be Jacob. They're going to show forth that that power as a mighty prince. They're going to be they're going to be ones who is who's going to uh, and up to like this. If if Moses is coming from the tribe of Israel, he's representing God, the Lord, but he's also part of Israel, the firstborn son, the son, as you see here. He noticed verse 23, and I say unto thee, let my son go that he may what serve me. And if, if thou refuse to let him go, I will slay thy son. Even thy firstborn. Notice that he may serve me. This is what he's making known that instead of serving you, because that's the way it's been. The, you've you've been you've had my son uh, uh, serving you. Come over to First Samuel uh, chapter sixteen now. First Samuel chapter sixteen, and, and see. This is the point here. This is what a son would do. A son would would work with his father. In his business, in his, uh, what his father is doing, not go and work with the competition. It, you know, you're not going to have someone with a Domino's, uh, a domino shirt on delivering pizza for, for Pizza Hut. It's not going to happen. Well, it shouldn't happen. It, it would look foolish if you order a, Domino's pizza and someone with a shirt on from another pizza company brings you brings it to you You're not you're gonna be confused. Look, look at uh, first Samuel chapter 16 verse 1 and the Lord said unto Samuel How long will thou mourn for Saul Saul seeing I have rejected him from reigning over Israel? Fill thy horn with oil and go I will send thee to Jesse the Bethlehemite for I have provided me a king among his sons. But notice, you, we know who Jesse is, Saul. But notice he says, the Bethlehemite. Where was Christ going to be born? Well, it shows Bethlehem. For I have provided me a king. Notice, I provided me a king amongst his sons. Now, we see that right there is a foretaste. But notice what he said here, reigning over Israel. Well, who's gonna who is gonna reign over Israel? This is talking about that throne of David. And and there shall come out a uh, uh, a root out of uh, out of Jesse. We see that over in, in, in uh, Romans chapter 15. Romans 15, I'll just cite the verse so 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 we'll um we'll we'll know. I want to make sure I get it get it word for word here and not and not paraphrase uh, what's being said there. But over here it says, um, uh, well, I'll just go here to, uh, there shall come out, of, there shall come out a root, uh, come, there shall be a root of Jesse, and he shall rise to reign over the Gentiles, and him shall the Gentiles trust. That's over in, in Romans 15, verse 12. But this root coming out of there, the Bethlehemite, for I provided me a king amongst his son. I, I, you know, I don't want to get into a history of Israel here, so let's just move on. But the point is, is a, a king among his sons. From, from, from that, that's where a king's going to come from. But it's going to be a son who's going to reign as a king to over Israel. But okay, come over to Luke, uh, Luke chapter two now. Come over to Luke. We're going to take a look at Luke for a minute here and look at the Lord Himself being that faithful son. And whom the Father is well pleased. Come over to Luke chapter 2. Look at verse uh, 42. Luke 2 verse 42. And when he was 12 years old, they went up to Jerusalem after the custom of the feast. 
And when they had fulfilled the days, they returned. The child tarried behind. The child Jesus tarried behind in Jerusalem. And Joseph, his mother, knew, of, knew not of it. But they, supposing him to have been in the company, went a day's journey. They sought him amongst their kinfolk and acquaintance. And they sought him among their kinfolks and acquaintance. Well, they you see they traveled. And he was 12 years old here. Um, they went up for the feast days. Um, they went a whole day's journey. And they lost him. You know, they lost the Messiah. You know, um, so they had to go back. They went had to go a whole day's back, you know. But you're going to see, you know, and it's going to make mention that they went three days. They went three days. And then they found the Messiah, you know. Um, and, and, you know, we see all through scripture about the 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 death, burial, and resurrection being foretold about there being three days. And then the Lord provided or, or they um, they they became redeemed, so to speak, you know. Uh, but that's a different study. Uh, but you're going to see and they're going to find the Lord. And what he's going to be doing, and he's going to make mention, he's going up, he's he's about his father's business as a faithful son. Not Joseph. He's speaking, he's going to be speaking about the most high, the Lord, his father in heaven, his business. Not a carpentry. They weren't at a carpentry convention. He's going to be going about his father's business. And he, he was in the temple. And this is this is what we see there. But let's take a look at that. Come over to uh, Luke Luke two again in verse forty five. And when they found him not, they turned back again to Jerusalem seeking him. And it came to pass that after three days, they found him in the temple, sitting in the midst of the doctors, both hearing them and asking them questions. Now, notice. Hearing them, he wasn't sitting there learning, but he was hearing them, and then he would ask them questions. Now, if you just stop there, people would say, well, yeah, they were teaching him because he's in the midst of the doctors, and the doctors, are, he's listening to what they got to say, and then he's saying, oh, really? Well, what about this? And he's asking questions. Now, look at what the next verse says. Uh, and all that heard him were astonished at his understanding and his, notice this, answers. I thought he was the one asking them questions. Why, why is he giving them answers? You would think he'd be getting, uh, when someone hears someone and asks questions, why are, they got, why are they the ones with the answers? That's the point. Because those doctors, he, he, he's, he, he did the same thing when he walked the earth, when he would say, is it not written in your law? And or, or, or when he would ask them questions, he, he would say things to, to them when they were uh, on the earth. Matter of fact, John, O generation of vipers, who have who have warned you to flee? But isn't isn't that a question? Well, sure it is. But then John gave them answers. Uh, look at verse 48. And when they saw him, they were amazed. And his mother said unto him, son. Why hast thou dealt with us? Uh, thus, why hast thou thus dealt with us? Behold, thy father and I have sought thee sorrowing. And he said unto them, How is it that you sought me? Wist ye not that I must be about my father's business? What, he, what the Lord said, You should have known that I was about my father's business. Why would? Why are you seeking me out like that? You should have known if I was anywhere, I would have been in the temple. That's the first place you ought to have looked. And they understood not the saying which he spake unto them. And he went down with them and came to Nazareth and was subject unto them. But his mother kept all these sayings in her heart. And Jesus increased in wisdom and stature and in favor with God and man. But notice he increased in wisdom. He was being educated by his father. The Lord wakened in his ear morning by morning and gave him more doctrine and more doctrine. And he 
he, he understood the scriptures and he grew in wisdom and sta increased in wisdom and stature and in favor with God and man. <coughs> Excuse me. But you see what this son, the Lord and Savior, was was doing? He was he was, he was increasing in his father's knowledge, in wisdom, and, and, and growing so he can be that faithful son that's going to be now educating others. And he and he did. And we too are are are, are shown that a faithful son is going to operate with what their father is teaching them. He's going to want to be in their likeness. He's going to want to be, as I said before, a little mini version or, or have his identity and, and take, take the identity of the father and that he too would be able to be, be that example and bring forth an identity of another, of another that's going to be in his likeness now. That's the point there. And we too are, are given the doctrine. And when we see, as I said before, we're going to be looking at this. We'll look at it in a minute about the adoption of children. The adoption of children. That there's more to just being only just justified. It's like beating a dead horse, uh, saying it over and over, folks. But guess what? And these things I say because when I, when, you know, I, I get feedback. I get the comments. I get the feedback. And the feedback that I get are from weaker brethren who do not understand this. And rather than look at the whole study, they rather just look at the title and say, the faithful, the saints and the faithful? What are you saying? You're saying saints can't be faithful? Or are you saying that you're saying there's two different types of people? You're saying that, that God has only saints and he has only just faithful brethren? You know, and, and this is what people are, you know, uh, that, that they don't grasp that there is a glory, that there's glory given unto unto faithful brethren, that they bring forth fruit and, and, and honor and glory of our Father. And it's not just about sitting in, in one place and, 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 and uh, singing and, and just having attendance, but it's about learning his word. I'm not, I'm not saying there's anything wrong with a local assembly. A local assembly is what God designs, desires that we that we, we 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 have, that we have a local church, that we be we are a church, but that we meet, but that we that we also come together, and that there be structure as a body. I I, I truly get that. There's definitely a necessity for that, but also, folks, but that we. We learn his word and bring forth fruit and honor and glory unto him. But we got a lot of verses to cover, so let's just get right to it. Matthew 3. Let's look, uh, hold your place in Luke. Um, we're going to be looking at Luke 4 in a, in a minute. But uh, come to Matthew 3 for a, a second. Come to Matthew 3, verse 16. Matthew 3, verse 16. And I just want to look at this because I made mention about it in the beginning. So let's just, um, I just want to cut away to here for a second. Then we're going to go back to Luke 4. Matthew 3, 16. And Jesus, when he, had, when he was baptized, went up straightway out of the water. And lo, the heavens opened, were opened unto him. Notice, unto him. And he saw the Spirit of God descending like a dove and lighting upon him. And of Lo, a voice from heaven saying, this is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. And you see, my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. And, you know, that was after he became baptized. He got baptized. He got baptized. And this was this was a fulfilling of things. This was something being done that was a fulfillment of of things that were to come and to be and to take be take to take place there. But come over to um a, a chapter four, Luke four, Luke four now, Luke chapter four. And I've made mention about this before, and um about the tempting of the Lord here, and the main reason of doing it was to look at um look at Satan and look at what what, what the power. The power of God versus the power of Satan is why we looked at it. But now, I want to look at it in a different aspect. 
Well, let, wait a minute. Yeah, okay, yeah. This time I want to look at the aspect of when he says, if thou be the son of God, that's why we're here. But come over to uh, verse 1, Luke 4, verse 1. And Jesus, being full of the Holy Ghost, returned from Jordan and was led by the Spirit into the wilderness. Notice he being full of the Holy Ghost and then led by the Spirit into the wilderness. Uh, verse 2, being 40 days tempted of the devil, and in those days he did eat nothing. And when they were ended, he afterward hungered. And the devil said unto him, If thou be the Son of God, command this stone that it be made that it be made bread. Now notice he says, If thou be the Son of God. Now he's saying, If thou be, because he knows that who he who he was, that beloved son in whom the Lord is well pleased. Well pleased. But but notice he's, he says here. That if you if if this is what you're saying, then okay, command this that this be that. What the what the Satan was looking upon, Satan looks upon power as something carnal, something that can fill the belly, something that can fill the pockets, something that you can see, because he's going to tell them that the glory of this world, of every kingdom of the world, the glory of them, is his power. And that, that, that's the point of what he's going to show him here. But he said, if thou be the son of God, command this stone that it be made bread. Well, so he can eat, of course. But the, watch what the Lord said. And Jesus answered him and saying, it is written that man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word of God. Now, you know, the foolish would say, well, wait a minute. A man can't eat the Bible. He can't eat scriptures. That's not going to fill him up because the Lord and Satan was looking at two different types of living, two different types of eating, two different types of one is spiritual, one's carnal. But by every word of God and the devil taking him up into a high mountain, showed him all the kingdoms of the world in a moment of time. And the devil said unto him, all this power will I give thee and the glory of them for it is the for that is delivered unto me and to whomsoever i will i give it and you know i'm going to break away for a second there but that's that's what i mean there are two different types of context with the word son over in romans 8 verse 4 12 all the way down through uh 19 is speaking about different types of sons. A son, uh, them who are if, being led by the Spirit, they are the sons of God. It, you know, they are the sons of God. Not all saints are going to be led by the living word of God. Not all saints are going to be live, uh, are, are going to live onto him. How shall you continue? Uh, well, shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? God forbid. How shall we that are dead to sin live there in any longer there's two there's types the different types of living just like in that same Romans chapter 6 it talks about we being dead with him we're still alive but dead is a different type of death just like what's being spoken about he's spoken about here when the Lord said man shall not live by every uh by bread alone but by every word that's talking about God knows that man should live, functionally live, sanctification by every word of God. Devil couldn't understand that. He couldn't see that. He's thinking about carnal. But let's 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 continue on there. Look at uh look at chapter four, verse seven. Notice it what he says here. In verse 7, if thou therefore will worship me, all shall be thine. Now, see, the devil's no dummy, of course. He knows that, the, that all the kingdoms of the world and the glory of them is delivered over to him. And he has rulership 
as a prince over all the world. And that's why it's not about the prince of the power of the air. That's why it talks about the, the all those princes that he has. He he put them in those angelic realms, the prince of Tyrus, the, the prince of uh, uh, Persia, the prince of Grecia. Those are his, his angels that he gave that he gave power unto, to whomsoever I will I give it. And he gave it unto them. And they ruled and reigned for a period of time. I'm not talking about the men. I'm talking about the angelic, the, the angelic um, ange angels who had people worship them. Um, look at verse 8. Jesus answered and said unto him, Get thee behind me, Satan, for it is written, Thou shalt worship the Lord thy God, and him only shalt thou serve. My point here is, he, when he says, "Being if thou be the Son of God, his viewpoint of the Son of God is different from the Lord's viewpoint of being the Son of God. Notice, him shall on, only him shall thou serve. He's going to say, it's his father's will. He's going to do his father's will. Look at verse 9. And he brought him to Jerusalem, set him on a pinnacle temp of the temple, and said unto him, If thou be the son of God, cast thyself down from hence. Notice he asked him twice, If thou be the son of God, do this. If thou be the son of God. But each time, it's always carnal. It's something so he can save his life. So he can save his physical life. It, it's carnal. It's it's tempting. Those are the temptations that was being spoken of. Tempted with this world. That's why when he told Peter, when he told he called Peter Satan, because Peter savorist the things of this world. And that was that the Lord not die. But he was thinking contrary. He was being an adversary. And that's what that's what's being shown here. Look at um uh, verse 10, for it is written, he shall give his angels charge over thee to keep thee, and in their hands shall they bear thee up, lest any time thou dash thy foot against a stone. Jesus answering said unto him, it is said, thou shalt not tempt the Lord thy God. But notice, that's what he was doing. He was tempting him. Uh, and I'm not saying tempting him like the Lord said, hmm, I wonder. No. It, the Lord didn't give it a thought. And when the devil had ended all the temptation, he departed from him for a season. And Jesus returned in the, in the power of the Spirit into Galilee. Remember, he went, he went, he was led by the Spirit. Now he's returned in the power of the Spirit into Galilee. And there went out a fame of him through all the region roundabout. And he taught in their synagogues, being glorified of all. But notice what it says here. There went out a fame of him throughout all the region round about. And he taught in their synagogues. Well, of the ones who brought he brought forth fame, was fame of him. Being glorified of, notice this, all. And notice... Notice what's next. He's coming to his own. <laughs> and I'm not saying that some of them wasn't his own either, but this is when he, he come to Nazareth now. And he came to Nazareth where he had been brought up. And as his custom was, he went into the synagogue on the Sabbath day and stood up for to read. Now, you would think when he went here, he would, um, he, he, he would be re received greatly. But... He went and he was glorified of all. He, there went out a fame about him. He taught in their those people's synagogue. Notice he went to their synagogues and was recept, received, and, and not just received, but being glorified of everyone. When he goes to Nazareth, where his custom was, he's been in, he's been in their synagogue many times. And, and we'll get to that in a second of what took place there in a second. But the point here is, when... He's received by as, as, as that as who he is. They received them. They believed on him. They believed on him as the redeemer, 
and also being received as what he's teaching unto them about the kingdom. He's telling, he's going to tell them, just like when, when John, when John went and went to prison, the Lord went out preaching, it said, the gospel. He told them to repent and, and about the same thing John was preaching, that they would be preaching the gospel so they can be justified unto eternal life. And they can walk in that sanctification as a holy nation in the kingdom of priests. But let's just get back to, um, you know, for time's sake, let's just get back to uh, Luke. And, and, and we'll see Luke 4, what was shown when he went back to his own country. Look at verse 18. The, and this is this is him in the temple here. We, we've seen in verse 16, he may mention he went. Uh, to the Sabbath, in the Sabbath day to read. And notice what he says here, the spirit of the Lord is upon me because he hath anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. He hath sent me to heal the brokenhearted, to preach the deliverance to the captives, recovering out, recovering of sight to the blind, to set at, set at liberty them that are bruised, to preach the acceptable year of the Lord. Now notice, how many times he has to say preach? He's going to his, he's going to the people in Nazareth. He's going to the, his hometown to to be received of them. To he's been received of others. He preached unto others and was glorified of them. But he wanted to come to his own here in his own his family. You know, you know his family and friends are there, brother and sister. Oh, it, but. Notice over and over, he's talking about preach the acceptable year of the Lord, preach the gospel to the poor, to heal the brokenhearted, to preach deliverance to them and, and set and, and recover and heal them. Look at verse 20, and he closed the book and he gave it to the minister and sat down. And the eyes of all them were, all them that were in the synagogue were fastened on him. Now, you know, a lot of people look at this and they say, oh, the Lord's rightly dividing the word of truth. He's not going to preach the rest of it because he knows that part's not coming to pass yet. Well, that, that's not what he's doing here. He's going to go and say that to those uh, to those Pharisees out there, to the to the Pharisees out there. He's going to explain what's going to happen um, uh, out there in, in that day there. And, and I, I've heard that teaching before, you know, and that's only the, there's something more deeper that's going on here, folks. Is what I'm saying. There's more of a mature understanding of what's going on here. What's taking place here is the Lord is preaching to them who are poor, who are the poor, the unsaved. He's preaching to the unsaved in the temple. They're not going to get it. They're not going to get what he's bringing forth unto them. That's why it's going to say he couldn't do any healing there. He couldn't heal many people there because there were not that many saved in Nazareth. But look at um, verse 21. And he began to say unto them, this day is scripture fulfilled in your ears. And he bear, he and all bear him witness and wondered at the gracious words which proceeded out of his mouth. And they said, is not this Joseph's son? Does that, what does that have to do with anything? What does being Joseph's son have to do with anything? But he's going to, and they bear him witness. They, they sat there and he looked at him. And when you see what's being said there, he, he, he's, they, they, um, he mentioned, is that, is that not Joseph's son? And then he, he said unto them, he will surely say unto me, this proverb, physician, heal thyself. Whatsoever we have heard done in Capernaum do also here in this country. I mean, that's what, that, that's what he said uh, um, he would love for them to say. But when he left from among them, he could not do, he could not do many things there. He could not do, um, you know, that's a whole different study. And we've looked at that before uh, about that, what, what he did there. About when he talks about the prophet is not uh, received in his own accepted in his own country and all them things he was not accepted there. But but they they wanted to know and the reason why I went here is this not Joseph's son? 
Why did they say, is this not the son of God? That's the point. That the, They're looking upon him as a mere man who's, who's, who's learned some things, so to speak. Look at uh, John 17. John 17. John 17, look at verse 1. These words spake Jesus and lifted up his eyes, lifted up his eyes to heaven and said, Father, the hour is come. Now, this is the point here. Now, the, um, Father, the hour is come. Glorify thy son that thy son also may glorify thee. Do you notice the father, the son, and that the son is going to do, bring forth glory? Glorify thy son and that, and that the son may glorify thee. You notice the two concepts being spoken of? Selflessness. The, the father is going to glorify the son and the sons are going to glorify him. If you don't think that we have this similar... Um, <clears throat> Let's see. What's the word to use here? And again, I, I have to choose my words for the for the ones that are the weaker brethren who 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 would say critique that. What do you mean? What? Do you, why would you say that? Are you not understanding? Are you trying to compare? You're trying to put us under Israel's program. What I'm trying to say here is that God has a similar 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 hope that we. That he glorifies us and we glorify him. If you don't think so, what, what do you think is being shown in Ephesians chapter 1, verse 2 and 3? That we have been blessed, who've blessed us with all spiritual blessings in heavenly places. But that's this is what we're, we have to see this first here, folks, and then we'll be able to walk right into our doctrine. That the son may also glorify thee. How is the son going to glorify him? He's going to do it based upon him presenting his the father's doctrine and him representing the father as he said he, he, he did. Verse 2, as thou hast given him power over all flesh, that he should give eternal life to, the, to as many as thou hast given him. And this is life eternal, that they may know thee, only true God and Jesus Christ, whom thou hast sent. Well, how are they going to know him? Jesus is going to bring it forth. He's going to bring that forth. I have glorified thee on the earth. Notice this. I have finished the work which thou hast gavest me to do. Wait a minute. So that's how he's glorified him. He's glorified him on the earth by finishing the work that he gave him to do. You know, we, we glorify um, our, our own earthly fathers um, by doing the work that they gave. If, if my father, if our parents gives us work to um, just say cut the grass, just say shovel the, shovel the walkway, shovel the sidewalk and things like that. Um, and then we come in and we... And not only do we just cut the grass, but we also bag up everything, put it out there neatly, do it the same way he would. Not only just shovel the shovel one walk walk way for someone to walk through, you know, um, but shovel the whole sidewalk, and not only just shovel it, but put some salt down there. Do it the way our father would do it. That would bring them glory. That would that be well pleasing to them. And we'd be glorified. Why? Because we've been taught by them. We know their will. We know that when it's snowing outside that, well, I know he's going to ask me, let me go do this. And I'm going to do it. I'm going to do this. It's going to be well-pleasing and acceptable unto them. It's going to be just like they would be doing it themselves. And, and the, when the Lord's bringing forth honor and glory unto the Father, he brought it forth. And he's, gonna, he's saying here in John 17, I'm, I'm giving unto them what we shared as father to son. I'm going to be bringing them in our likeness. And they, too, are going to bring forth glory um, uh, on this world that of us. And we have glory in them, the apostles. 
But let's take a look at that. Come over to uh, verse 16 now. John 17, verse 16. And he's speaking of, and we're, I'm just skipping across here. Um, Brent, I'm pretty sure you're familiar with this. Uh, they, the, the 12, well, the apostles, they are not of the world, even as I am not of the world. Sanctify them through thy truth. Thy word is truth. As thou hast sent me into the world, even so I have sent them into the world. Well, again, they're not of the world. That's because they, they, they've they learned. They, they learned and they uh, grew up, so to speak. Remember in John chapter 7, he may mention that they're, they are of the world and that they, well, I don't mean they're of the world, but they uh, the world can't hate them yet because they have not testified that the world, of the world, that the world is evil. But here, he says they're not of the world. And then he says, sanctify them through thy truth. Thy word is truth. In other words, the word is going to sanctify them. The word is going to build them up that they be no more children themselves. That they, as he said to he said unto them, he said, I have many things to say unto you, but you are not able to bear them. You are not yet able to bear them. Peter denied him three times. He didn't deny him later on in the ministry, but he denied him there. He was not yet ready. Look at verse 20. Neither pray I for these alone, but for them also which shall believe on me through their word. That's going to be that's going to be others. That's going to be the ones that are going to be over in Acts chapter 2, 3, 4, Acts chapter uh, just all throughout the, uh, the book of Acts. They also is who he's talking about, that he prays for them. Uh, look at verse 20. That they all, not just, the, not just the apostles, that they all be one as thou, Father, art in me and I in thee, that they also may be one in us, that the world may believe that thou hast sent me. You see the glory? That's not just only just between the Father and the, and the Lord. That all, that's the whole destination. I'm not talking about the Pharisees too, but the ones that believe, believed on him, that they be, that they, uh, um, you know, we've seen those Pharisees that believed him, believed on him, but did not confess him. Well, those were only ones that were only just justified. They are going to be counted as the least in the kingdom. But the ones that also confessed him, we, all you have to do is look at the, the apostles. They didn't confess him. You, you see, and I, don't, and, and I don't mean to say it that they never confessed him. But what I'm saying is they, when they said, do you know, weren't you with him? We seen you with him. The other ones ran, didn't even stick around to see what happened. But he said to Peter, they said to Peter, weren't you with him? No, I don't know him. He denied him three times. He didn't confess them. But um, look at uh, verse, um, yeah, verse 21, that they, that all might be one, that all may be one as thou, Father, art in me, I in thee, that they also may be one in us. That's an identity. And, and see, I'm going here because we too, we're being compared with the, in the Lord's likeness but also with the father, but the Lord's likeness as a son. That's the point. And that's what's being shown here, that God desires sons, faithful sons. He desired them in Israel's program. That's the point. Look at verse 22. And the glory which thou gavest me, I have given them, that they may be one, even as we are one. Wait a minute. So the, the, so the glory which the Lord the father gave to the son, he gave to them that they may be one, even as he says, we are one. I in them, thou in me, that they may be made perfect in one, and that the world may know that thou hast sent me and has loved them as thou hast loved me. Notice, as thou hast loved me, 
Well, what did the Lord say? What did the, what did the father say to the son? This is my son in whom I am well pleased. Well, he wants to be well pleased as, notice, as thou hast loved me. He wants the father to be able to say as well, this is my son Peter in whom I am well pleased. This is my son John in whom I am well pleased. This is my son James and so on and so on. And we're looking at this likeness, folks, because again, as I said before, we're looking at the father, father, God and father of our Lord Jesus Christ. But I want us to see this likeness. Now come over to verse, uh, chapter 18 now, John 18. John 18, look at verse 10. Then Simon Peter, having a sword, drew it and smote the high priest's servant and cut off his right ear. The servant's name was Malchus. Then Jesus said unto Peter, Put up thy sword into thy sheath. The cup which my father hath given me, shall I not drink it? The cup which my father hath given me, shall I not drink it? What he's saying there, he's explaining that you're going to stand in the way of my father's will. Again, Peter was being an adversary. Again, he was being Satan, an adversary. He was standing, he was looking at things in a carnal way. He, as the Lord told him, thou savorest the things that be of man. And, and, and his, his, you're not following the will of the father. He told them that over there, and we, if we get a chance, we'll take a look at that. When he told them, um, told them before about what's going to take place, about that watch, that watching. And he told them, uh, could you not watch? Because he gave them instruction before about the temptation of the world and what a faithful servant does. And a faithful son, what a faithful son would do, he would he wouldn't uh, have he wouldn't be sleep or, or or we use that terminology today when someone says, "Hey, don't sleep on that," you know, or or don't hey don't let them catch you sleeping, you know, whether it's men or women who use that, you know, use that terminology. But let's just move on for time's sake here, and let's yeah let's take a look at that. Come over to Luke chapter twelve. Luke chapter twelve. Look at verse 37. Luke 12, verse 37. Blessed are those servants whom the Lord, when he comes, shall find watching. Verily I say unto you, that he shall gird himself and make them to sit down to meet and will come forth and serve them. You know why? Because these are faithful servants who are watching. Well, you'll see why they're watching. And why they're going to get glory? They're going to get the one who's who's um, the one who's well, I don't want to use the word hired uh, hired them, but whose serve whose master they are, he's going to serve them because he's going to appreciate them because they're watching out. Look at verse 33, 38. And if he shall if he shall come in the second watch. Or come in the third watch and find them so blessed are those servants. See, there's different watchings because there's different times. While someone else is sleeping, someone's watching. They're watching out. You know, people knew what this meant when it came to, uh, you know, back in the day. Where you have people watching out, whether it's, whether it's someone watching out for the sheep and cattle or uh, making sure no wolves come in there and steal them away. Um, or whether it's just watching for the for the enemy but look at um but he said blessed are those servants and I, we're getting here because next week we're going to look at blessed us with all spiritual blessings in heavenly places we to be faithful servants ones that's not going to one that we're told to uh, watch paul tells us that throughout scripture T take heed and watch and all those things um look at verse 39 now and thus, and this know that if the good men of the house had known what hour the thief would come, he would have watched 
and have not and had and not have suffered his house to be broken through. Now, he's going to be talking about those who, if they were, were asleep, you know, um, the, 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 the servants who would be asleep. Uh, now, come over to, um, but I just want you to keep that into, in the back of your mind, but come over to Mark 14 now, Mark 14, because this is where he told them. He, he gave them this instruction about the blessed servant, the blessed servant who is watching out in the first, second, and third watch. Blessed are those servants. Look at chapter 14, verse 32. Mark 14, verse 32. And they came to a place which is called Geth Gethsemane. That's always a tongue biter for me, folks. Because <laughs> Gethsemane, uh, let's just say a little, you know what, I, what, what I'm saying here. And he said to, and he saith to the disciples, sit here, sit ye here while I shall pray. And he taketh with him Peter and James and John and began to be sore amazed and to be very heavy. And he saith unto them, my soul is exceeding sorrowful unto death. Tarry ye here and watch. Now, when he said that, just a word, they should say, wait a minute. I remember the instruction of the Lord. I remember the instruction of the faithful servant that's going to be watching. But he's, the Lord is going now to pray unto his father as a son, as a son that's going to fulfill all things, as a son that's going to uh, uh, drink what his father given him, the cup. He's going to partake of the ministry there, fulfill the ministry. And he's telling them, and his soul is exceeding sorrowful unto death being he very heavy. He told them, tarry ye here, wait you here, and watch. Watch out, in other words. Look at verse 35. And he went a little forward. He went forward a little and fell on the ground and prayed that if it were possible, the, uh, the hour might pass from him. And he, and he said, Abba, Father, all things are possible unto thee. Take away this cup from me. Nevertheless, wait a minute, take away this cup from me. Nevertheless, not what I will, but what thou wilt. And what the, I said this before, and I'll say it again. He's saying, Abba Father. And he's not saying, Oh, please, Father, Abba Father, just take this cup away from me. I, I don't want to really, I don't want to do this, and I don't want to go suffer. And, you know, I'd rather you don't. Um, it, it, it's, it's, but if it's going to be your will, let it be your will. That's not what he's saying here. He told not only just the apostles about he's going to go and suffer all things and he's going to uh, uh, be uh, he's going to be persecuted and die and raise again the third day. But the scriptures foretold what he was going to suffer. He knew what was shown over there in the book of Psalms or what it, it talked about what death he would he would uh, die. He knew this. But what he's saying is. Abba Father, I, I, I got the cup before me. I got the cup before. I, I see your will. That this is your will. And and I'm gonna for, I'm fulfilling it. But that's a different study again, as I said before. Uh look at verse 37. And he cometh and findeth them sleeping, and saith unto Peter, Simon, sleepest thou? Couldst not thou watch one hour? Uh, verse 38, watch ye here and pray, lest ye enter, lest ye enter into temptation. The spirit is truly ready, but the flesh is weak. But not just watch, but watch and notice, pray. Pray unto the Father, lest ye enter into temptation. He was telling them to pray unto the Father, watch and pray. He, he found it and he said it unto them three times. He went to the... You know why it was three times? First watch, second watch, third watch. He came to them sleep. And, and when you know, and when he when he came unto them those times when he came back and he when he when he rose from the dead and he showed himself, they were all into one place and they were there. And he's and he's and he said, he mentioned unto them about having them had they any meat. <laughs> you know, and um they're just sitting around and they should be out preaching him. 
They shouldn't have been just sitting around in one, gathered into one place, eating meals and things like that, having fellowship meals. They were wasting time. When he went out to them, they were fishing. Have you any, he said, uh, uh, lovest thou me more than these? That wasn't just saying, that was Peter. That's why I said, thou lovest me? He asked him three times. Lovest me? Feed my sheep. If you love me, go feed my sheep. Feed my lambs. What are you doing sitting here wasting time going a fishing? But again, they knew that later on. They about just having a fellowship meal. There, there, there's no edification in that. There, there's no glory in that. You, you're not sons because you're 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 not bringing forth glory onto the Lord. The Lord wasn't always just sitting around having fellowship meals, having Lord's supper. Again, these these are things we have to come to understand, folks. That that God our Father would would have faithful sons. He would have faithful sons that that desire to live unto the Father. And as he and he, if we see that glory that was shared with the Lord, that we too that that our Father desires that we too bring forth a glory and live unto him and that we glorify him as he glorified us. And you, and you don't think that that's the case? When you look at Romans chapter 8, Romans, just, just Romans chapter 8, for instance, when it says here, and we know that all things work together for good to them that love God, to them who are the called according to his purpose, for whom he did foreknow, them he did also predestinate to be conformed to the image of of his son. Moreover, whom he did predestinate, them he also called, them he called, them he also justified, them he justified, them he also glorified. Yeah, I know I hope we see the uh, familiar famil uh, the identity. I'm not going to use the familiar or similarity. I didn't really use those terminologies. I'm just going to say what it is, identity. The identity with the Son and with the Father. Be conformed to the image of his Son. That's what I desire. I hope that's your desire too, to be conformed, to be conformed to the image of his Son. And we can do it today, folks. We can do it daily. We can do it not when we get to heavenly places. And people think being conformed to the image of his Son is the new glorified body that we're going to get. That's not what it's, it's not what that's talking about. It's talking to them who love God, to them that love God, to them who are the called according to his purpose. Not just to them that love God because he just justified them. Them who have the operating upon the selfless love of God. That when all those things in verse 30, verse 35 of Romans 8 down to verse 39, who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Who shall separate us from the selfless love? Who shall separate us from operating upon the selfless love of Christ? Shall tribulation, distress, persecution, famine, a necklace, per nakedness, perilous war? It would if you if you, if you love yourself more. If you love yourself more, and you're not a living sacrifice. When sufferings come your way, you're going to say, well, "Wait a minute, what about me? What about my sufferings?" You're, a living sacrifice don't doesn't do that. A living sacrifice says, "When I'm going through these sufferings, are not worthy to be compared with the glory." which shall be revealed in us. That's how a son thinks. That's sonship. That's how a son ought to act. That's what a faithful son acts. That's how he acts. He looks upon what his father teaches him. He, when, you get a, when you get a son who's told to go out there and cut the grass or to go uh, shovel the snow, he's not going to say, wait a minute, you do know the, uh, the game is on. You do know I'm watching so-and-so. You, you no. He, he's going to do his parents' will. To them that love his parents selflessly, he's going to oper operate upon their will, not his own. Now, I hope we're getting this, folks. I truly hope that this is a, this is not as as others understand about a son. But I I, I truly hope we're we're we're, gra we're gra grasping and uh, gravitating to what's being shown here. Um, as how sons, how God would have his sons to, to respond on to him. But um, I want to thank everyone for tuning in to another Thursday Night Bible Study. Until next time, thank you.